This episode, we ask the question, how did a nurse from Australia wind up at the top of the Gestapo's most wanted list? It's a story of espionage, danger, and a whole lot of sass. I'm gonna tell you all about World War II badass, Nancy Wake. Hello and welcome, my name's Jess Perkins, I'm here with Dave Warnicke and Matt Stewart and I'm not normally given the responsibility of introing things and I think I did a pretty good job. I reckon that that was near perfection. Yeah. How could I have done better? There's always room for improvement. Okay. But you don't have any specific... Oh, and I'm terrible at feedback. <laughs> terrible at taking it, terrible at giving it. I hate criticism. Please do not comment about my appearance. I would have just added a bit more of your own personality into it. Okay. Um, do you want to have another go but just have fun with it? Yeah. Let's go for one more. This one's just for safety. Okay. <laughs> okay. You're remembering that you nailed it. But just something a bit fun. Yeah, yes. we've already got it. Um, but okay. why not? Let's just go for a big one. Yeah, all right. Why Let's see what happens. So go big. Yeah. Go big. Just Spoiler imagine, space. Imagine you're a polar bear. Just go for it. Just Cold. For you're big and furry. Yes. Oh, I'm going to kill a man if I want to. Ah, fish. Yeah. Love it. I mean, you didn't hit the script points, but still... I reckon it's worth keeping. Yeah. I reckon we'll use that option. Yep. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to tell you all about Nancy Wake. Have either of you heard about Nancy Wake? I feel like I know that she might be Australian, but that is about it. Okay. Matt, anything to add? Well, I recently learned that she might be Australian. <laughs> Interesting points from Are both either of you. us correct? Well, Nancy Wake was born in Wellington, New Zealand. <laughs> in 1912 and moved to Australia when she was about two. We'll, we'll oh, claim wow. it. We'll we totally do. claim that. And we do that in Australia Russell Crowe, Farlap. Uh, Lamingtons. Lamingtons. Pavlova. Pavlova. Jacinda Ardern. Jacinda Ardern is our ours. Prime Minister. Our fantastic Prime Minister. We love her. Don't. She's so good. Don't Google that. She had a go. She's got to go. These are references that will play well internationally. <laughs> and long term. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, she was the youngest of six children which is on the cusp of too many, you know? Six, it's a good amount. Back in those days, yeah, when was it? Yeah, six is 1912. 1912, good, a good amount of children. That's conservative, that. I think. 1912, fantastic year. Fantastic year, one of the best. At the age of four, her father abandoned the family and went back to New Zealand, leaving Nancy's mother to raise the children I'd, alone. I'd just like to say we are not claiming He's father. a Kiwi. He's not Australian. Yeah. He's a New Zealander, no doubt about it. Yeah, go back, because you're not welcome here yeah. Thank you. with the Australian Nancy Drew or whatever her name was. <laughs> Wake. Wank. Wank. <laughs> Why are you saying wank? You talking to me? <laughs> Giving you a clear instruction there, mate. Oh, Go have a wank and come back. <laughs> come on, you need to blow off some Fre steam. Freshen that mind up. <laughs> All right, well, can we cut? <laughs> no. no. No, we'll just go on without you. What are you going to take, three, four seconds? <laughs> Lucky I've got this ye olde porn here. <laughs> what's, it, what's it pictures of? Ankles? Well, no, it's all, it's all pros. <laughs> Thou lady doth protested her pants off. <laughs> Whoa. Wow. That'll do. I don't think we can. Didn't I even need to get the hands involved. I think, I think we have to beep that out. Yeah, in this time slot. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> I assume you're watching this at 6 a.m. <laughs> well, 6 p.m. Still too mm. early. Yeah, at 6 a.m. somewhere. So her dad leaves, goes back to New Zealand, leaves the mum to raise the kids alone. And um, some say that this event is believed to have sparked her rebellious and fearsome nature. I like how well you've committed to this. Some say that she, she may <laughs> they believe, have believed <laughs> that allegedly, <potentially> <laughs> and I've heard she might be Australian. Yeah. <laughs> Shut up, I'm doing my best. At 16, she ran away from home, um, initially working as a nurse before using 200 pounds that she'd inherited from an aunt um, to go traveling. And she traveled first to New York and then to London. Oh, she, sick. She left. So when she gets to London, she studied journalism and she gained work for the Hearst group of newspapers. And then she moved to Paris and she married a wealth. <laughs> she married a wealth. Wow. wow. I mean, that's my Let brain. me just start again. Just a big pile of money. <laughs> <laughs> she fashioned it into a man. <laughs> Put a little moustache on. Oh, I love you, Terence. <laughs> <laughs> She married a wealthy French industrialist. Oh, Terence? Called Henri. Oh. Henri Fiocca. Oh. <laughs> I beg your pardon? <laughs> Fiocca. Fiocca. How's Fiocca. That? How would you say that in Australian? Fiocca. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Why? How would you say it? Sounds like fucker to me. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> they got married in 1939 when she was 27 years old. And six months later, the newlyweds were living in Marseille uh, when Germany invaded France. Nancy drove ambulances during the, the war in France and after the French surrendered to Germany, Nancy and Henri joined the resistance, assisting in the escape of Allied servicemen and Jewish refugees from France into neutral Spain. So they did this as part of the escape network called the Pat O'Leary Line. Mm. Um, and more than 100 volunteers, <laughs> people like Nancy, were captured and killed. But not our girl Nancy. Oh, thank goodness. People like her, but not her. Right. Yeah. But not her. I must stress that. The story ends here. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for joining us again <laughs> on the show we are doing now. Back to you in the studio. <laughs> And I think oh, you're yeah, in the yeah, studio. Yeah, the studio. Okay, the studio. cool. Right, okay. So the studio and the, the correspondent are actually only a few feet away from each other. Back to you. <laughs> <laughs> so Nancy started to get a bit of a reputation. The Gestapo called her the white mouse. Oh, because that. she just always managed to elude being captured. They'd be like, like oh, a come white here. Mouse. Like a mouse. You ever tried to catch a mouse? Not a white mouse. No. no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, Nancy, Nancy Drew, she's my white mouse. <laughs> <laughs> What's this character you're doing? I love it. I just back want more information. In okay, <laughs> yeah, back to me. So they wanted to capture her so badly that the Gestapo were tapping her telephone and intercepting her mail. They just couldn't capture her. They uh, apparently knew where she lived to get her mail. <laughs> We've got your address. We've got your phone number. We know roughly where you'd be we most just... of the time. Can't get her. We know what kind of cheese you like. Yeah. <laughs> We've set an elaborate trap. Let's <laughs> eat the cheese. <laughs> so the resistance, knowing that the Gestapo wanted her so badly, they exercised extreme caution with her missions um, because her life was in constant danger. Oh. Not that she cared. <laughs> she said, I don't see why we women should just wave our men a proud goodbye and then knit them balaclavas. She was like, get me in there. I mean, Honestly, what? yeah, I don't see a reason why they would do that either. No. Surely there's other things you could do. Yeah. <laughs> Knitting balaclavas. Yeah. Was that, is that, was that such a dumb thing that it became a cliche? We're all waving our men goodbye and knitting our balaclavas. Well, people need balaclavas, Matt. I hadn't thought of it like that. But maybe like the, didn't the women that stayed home, they like knitted shit to send to the soldiers and stuff? Yeah. yeah. Like imagine opening a package, another fucking balaclava. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, I need gloves. <laughs> I've got eight balaclavas. I'm <laughs> nude from the neck down. <laughs> it's cold over here. here. But my head is so warm. Face is so warm. My face feels so <laughs> Not good. Not my eyes or mouth. <laughs> They're cold. I think another thing they used to do would be to knit white ribbons and put them on cowards. Yeah. Do they knit them? I don't think you need a ribbon. Um, I think it was white feathers too, actually. So <laughs> They knitted white feathers. Yes. I'm sorry. Yep. It wasn't cows, it was cows. <laughs> <laughs> they made feather jackets for cows in winter. Feather boas. Feather boas. They were fancy cows. <laughs> so then things started to get a bit more dangerous uh, and the escape network had been compromised by spies a couple of times. Oh. So fearing being captured, Nancy fled France and her husband, Henri, stayed behind. So in the process of getting out of France, she was actually arrested um, along with a trainload of people who'd also been trying to flee. And the head of the Pat O'Leary line, that escape network, it was a guy called Albert Guresi. Probably said that wrong. I was so sure he was going to be named Pat O'Leary. <laughs> no. Do Don't we, know who Pat O'Leary is. We never know. Ah. Or I didn't find out. Anyway, <laughs> so Albert, he managed to have her released by saying that she was his mistress. Um... <laughs> Did he say that for everyone on the train? <laughs> I'm a very horny man. <laughs> <laughs> These are all my mistresses. Um, yeah, so he was like, oh, that, she's trying for her husband not to find out. She's my mistress, let's just... And they believed him, um, and so she was released. Wait, who was that man? Who's Albert? The head of the Pat O'Leary line, so and the head of the escape mean? network. Okay, so he's the head of the escape network. Yes. Who's capturing her and then letting her go? The... Germans? Yeah, the, the people. Why, do they, why has the head of the escape network got any sway in that combo? That's a great point. Or is he like undercover as a German guy? I don't know. They probably just thought that he was just, yeah, a normal citizen going, hey, oh, you should let her go. She's my mistress. And oh. they all probably just started high fiving yeah. her and went, uh, awesome. nice. oh, some man's mistress. No worries, yeah. bro. Here you go. Have your tap mistress it. back. <laughs> <laughs> tap it. Tap it. Tap it. <laughs> Tap this, then tap that, am I right? <laughs> all right. Yeah, high five all over again. It took hours. People don't do that, sort of say tap that anymore. 
but back then yes. I was doing it ye olde speak. Mm. Don't not like I was trying to talk in modern lingo. Yeah, mm-hmm. Nazis but really ruined that, didn't they? They did. Tap Everyone me, was doing it. Tap me fist. <laughs> tap ze <zi> fist. <laughs> <laughs> tap ze fist. So she manages to um, to get out of France and into Spain. But was she finished fighting? <laughs> Not quite. Oh. She gets back to England in June of 1943 and she joins the SEO, the Special Operations Executive, and gets trained in a bunch of different programs. And programs basically being like badass, cool stuff. And also really got uh, the Army's search results optimised. <laughs> yes. <laughs> SEO joke there. <laughs> Fucking nerd. <laughs> but uh, g- 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 Google stuff. <laughs> there was a um, British intelligence officer named Vera Atkins, and she described Nancy as a real Australian bombshell. Tremendous vitality, flashing eyes. Everything she did, she did well. I'm also imagining this in like a 40s voice, though. <laughs> yeah. I like how that, they're classic Australian things. Flashing eyes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah bombshell. Yeah. yeah. You know. Doing Australians. things well. Yeah. That's what we do. All things that, yeah, we definitely all do as well. All of us. All of us. uh, Don't look into it. Training reports also say um, that she was an excellent shot and that she put the men to shame by her cheerful spirit and strength of character. So she's just an all-round great person to be around. So now that she was all trained up, um, she's ready to go and fight again. But she can't just exactly walk back into France, can she? Because because it's a long way. It's a long way. Mm. (laughs) And also she's wanted. She got a hovercraft. Uh, close. Hoverboard. Hoverboard. No, she parachutes in. Oh, oh that's badass. Hover shoot. Obviously. Hover shoot. Hover shoot. She parachutes in and uh, and she and, and a group all sort of parachuted in together and they got tangled in some trees. And the resistance leader that they were meeting, another guy called Henri, he discovered her all tangled in a tree and he apparently said, I hope that all the trees in France bear such beautiful fruit this year. Wow. And oh. she slapped him across the chops. She said, don't give me that French shit. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great line. Ugh, I hope <laughs> all the trees in France. Am I doing a good job? Or is yeah, this, no, please is keep this going. problematic? No, I want to hear more. I hope all the trees in France have such a beautiful fruit this year. Yeah, that's a lovely sentiment. (laughs) And then in her beautiful Australian accent, she said, fuck off. (laughs) With her flashing eyes. Yeah. You are wearing a a French stereotype shirt. Stripes. Blue and white stripes. You're just missing the beret. Oh. Sorry. Beret. I'm always wearing a beret. Oh. In here. Okay. <laughs> I'm always wearing a balaclava in here. <laughs> right. What are you always wearing in here? Um, a <laughs> crotchless chat. Go on. What were you going to say? I was going to say, say dildo. dildo. Were you? Yeah. In I here. could tell. You okay. can have whatever you want in there. That's fine. In my heart. You just got. That's for you. I could tell by your face. That was your dildo face. Yeah. I was like, he's about to say dildo. I, I mean, about to relate. Oh, well, I. <laughs> I wasn't just, the face was, I'm about to reveal a piece of myself. Yeah, vulnerability. Vulnerable. Can I just say, we all have dildo faces. Anyway, um, (laughs) so while she was uh, there working with the French resistance, she and her team were liaisons between London and local resistance groups. So they were organising parachute drops of arms and equipment and coordinating attacks on German forces in the area. But she seemed to be pretty good at putting out fires as well. So every time a problem arose, she came up with a solution. So on one occasion, the radio operator had left his radio and codes behind and the SEO team needed it to be in contact with London. So without the codes, they couldn't get fresh orders or any supplies. The radio man left his radio and codes behind. Yes. He sounds useless. Yeah, I mean, that's the... That's his entire job. Without that, he's but a man. He's just a man. But a man. But a man. Our favourite <laughs> superhero. <laughs> so the nearest uh, other SEO radio and operator uh, were in Chateau. So she borrowed a bicycle and rode it all the way. Uh, and she said, I got there and they said, how are you? And I cried. <laughs> I couldn't stand up, I couldn't sit down, I couldn't do anything, I just cried. Nonetheless, she found the radio there, updated London on the situation and then bicycled back, travelling 500 kilometres or 310 miles in 72 hours. Wow. On that a seems bike. like a lot. Seems like a lot. Yeah. It is, so ah. good observation there. Thank God. 
Um, she was part of the raid that destroyed the Gestapo headquarters, resulting in the death of 38 Germans. In an interview long after the war, she was asked about this raid and a story that she had killed a sentry with her bare hands to prevent him from raising the alarm. It was like this rumour that had gone around for a long time that she'd killed a man with his bare arms. And I think they were kind of expecting her to be like, no, but she was like, yeah, I did. <laughs> she, she says, they'd taught this judo chop stuff with the flat of the hand at SEO and I practised away at it. But this was the only time I used it. Whack! And it killed him, all right. I was really surprised. <laughs> <laughs> so usually in an interview, she's just like, yeah, I just kind of went, ugh, and he died. She's panicking. <laughs> Doesn't know what to do. <laughs> hadn't, thought, chop. hadn't thought this far ahead. Did you say it was a sentry, like a 100-year-old man? Because uh, that's less surprising. Sentry more like um, a lookout. Oh, would you call a hundred-year-old man a century? What? Yeah, a hundred-year-old man as a lookout. Centurion. That's a terrible lookout too. Their vision is not very good. We assume mm. they've you seen it all Dave. though. So that's true. Think about it that they way. see everything. Coming. Haven't seen a judo chop though. Yeah, didn't see that coming, did he? <laughs> <laughs> that's not funny. A man died. Um, <laughs> yeah, but he got judo chopped, so it is pretty. So funny. It's pretty great. And he was a Nazi. Yeah. And a century. Wow, so many things to so many people. Yeah. What a guy. I know. Another quote from her was, in my opinion, the only good German was a dead German. And the deader, the better. Oh, okay. I don't know how this levels keep judo chopping? I don't know how this levels are dead. She's already dead. <laughs> she had to be dragged <laughs> off. She's just chopping him. She goes, I killed a lot of Germans and I'm only sorry I didn't kill more. Okay. Yep. If you change that to Nazis, it feels totally. better. Yeah, na- <laughs> yeah. I'll read it again. In my opinion, the only good Nazi was a dead Nazi. Ah, oh, I feel better about I that. I killed a lot of Nazis, and I'm only sorry I didn't kill more Nazis. Yeah. That's a bit better, isn't it? Because otherwise, you know, she, in her mind, Bjorn Borg should be dead. Is he German? <laughs> I couldn't think of a German no. person. <laughs> <laughs> Gary Porsche? Is Porsche even German? Ferdinand Porsche. Gary Porsche. <laughs> Mr. BMW? What's a... What, uh, Boris Becker. You Boris Becker. Becker. Boris there Becker. we go. Thank you. Boom, boom. <laughs> Bjorn Borg. My <laughs> nana used to think I looked like Boris Becker when I was a kid. Like when I was like three or something. Oh, little Boris Becker. Okay. Over there. My nana had a child's voice. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Oh, look at little Boris Becker over there. <laughs> boom, boom. <laughs> nana. <laughs> Wait, so this is you now? Yeah, I'm also a child. Oh, well, I was a child. Me. Of course it's I had a child's <laughs> voice. So confusing. Still do. Still do. So apparently, <laughs> so the war ends, oh. and it wasn't until the war was ending that at a victory party, Nancy found out that her husband, Henri, had been captured, tortured, and executed earlier oh. in the war by the Gestapo, apparently because he refused to give up her location. So she only found out at the end of the war that her husband had been killed. Um, after the war, she was awarded so many medals. Here's a few of them. She was awarded the George Medal from the UK for gallantry, um, the Légion, the Honneur, I'm so sorry, uh, from the French Republic, the highest order of merit for military and civil merits, um, the Medal of Freedom from the United States, the Companion of the Order of Australia, and the Royal New Zealand Returned and Services Association's highest honour, which is the RSA Badge in Gold. It's ah, called the Badge in Gold. Serve alcohol at the- the bottle shop. Yeah, she's got her RSA. So good on her. Um, that's I do probably the great most initialism humour. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's really good stuff. Thank you. Definitely the most impressive of those medals <laughs> as well. She also played in the NBA. I think. <laughs> <laughs> After the war ended, uh, Nancy worked for a while in the SEO offices in Paris and then London. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still IT. She's working in IT. She just wanted a quieter life. No, so she's working. Um, uh, in Paris and London before she decided to return to Australia in early 1949. Um, but did she opt for a quiet life in Australia? <laughs> nah. Oh. She ran as a Liberal candidate in the 1949 Australia federal election for the Sydney seat of Barton, running against Dr Herbert Evatt, who was at the time the Deputy Prime Minister. Wow. So she challenges the Deputy PM. She wasn't successful, but she ran again in 1951 and only lo- lost by a really, really small margin. So now she's a politician. Well, kind almost. of. Almost. <laughs> Aspiring. <laughs> Um, shortly after the 1951 election, she moved back to England again um, and worked as an intelligence officer in the Royal Air Force. Um, and she left that job in 1957 when she married um, an officer there, John Forward. 
Uh, and in the early 60s, the couple moved back to Australia once again. And once again, she ran as a Liberal candidate in the 1966 federal election um, for the Sydney seat of Kingsford Smith. 1966, that's actually the year my football team, the St Kilda Saints, won the Premiership. Huh, you don't say. It's a fun fact. That is a fun fact. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing. And we should say probably the Liberal, the Liberal Party in Australia is the Conservative Party, confusingly. Yeah. In case this guy <laughs> watching at home doesn't know. <laughs> Maybe he doesn't. We don't know. Hi, Phil. Hi, <laughs> Phil. Hi, Phil. Let us know if you've got any other questions. Yeah, hit us up. HMU, write in the comments. Comment below, who's your favourite Deputy <laughs> Prime Minister? Mm. I can't name one. What about Tim Fisher? Is Michael McCormick now? Yes. Oh, I did one. Yeah, you know one. <laughs> That'll change. Um, <laughs> well, that wasn't a threat. I just mean in time. <laughs> Unless he lives forever. <laughs> yeah, I'm good on him, I guess. Um, so anyway, so they're, they're going back and forth. She's back in Australia. Again, she ran in 1966. It was a close race, but she was ultimately unsuccessful. Beaten by the St Kilda Football Club, I believe. Yeah, yeah the whole team became the Prime Minister. <laughs> That's what happens when you win the grand final, yeah. is we make you Prime Minister for a day. <laughs> it's like a kid's project. It's really sweet. Um, so then in the mid-80s, she and her husband John retired to Port Macquarie on the New South Wales coast, and she released her best-selling autobiography, The White Mouse. Oh, great. Where did she get the name from? The Nazis. Oh, okay. And she's some sort of a war hero of ours? <laughs> and she's taking names from Nazis? Yeah, Interesting. Random Nazi name generator. Yeah. <laughs> the White Mouse. Okay. All right, cool. Okay. That's Catchy. what it is. Doesn't sound like she's so Nancy woke after all. <laughs> <laughs> oh, now you remember her name. <laughs> um, after living in Port Macquarie for about 12 years, um, John passed away in 1997 um, after they'd been married for 40 years. So they together a really long time. Saints played in the grand final that year. And? Well, I don't want to talk about it. Did what Na happened? Nancy beat him. Nancy got her, she got away. <laughs> Finally. She got away with us. She took us to town. Beat us by about six girls. Classic Nancy. You dog. <laughs> <laughs> no, mouse. Mouse, mouse sorry. White mouse. Because they couldn't, mouse. couldn't capture, you could catch a dog. <laughs> you white could dog. catch a dog? Yeah, easy. Oh, prove it. Like an old dog who's a bit slow, easy. Okay, yeah, well I could catch an old mouse that was a bit slow. How? Well, they're little. Just grab it. <laughs> and you said I, I got it get now. Oh, you've got the mouse. Evan, now. could you put a mouse in my hand? Yeah, and edit a mouse in. <laughs> I got it. I got it. But I'm imagining an old computer mouse. You know the one with the balls in them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this mouse has got balls in it. Evan, make sure it's got big balls. <laughs> Later in her life, Nancy sold her many medals, saying there was no point in keeping them. I'll probably go to hell, and they'd melt anyway. I love her so much. But cash, that will last forever. Yeah, yeah. cash I can take with me. Thank you very much. Heat resistant. So then in 2001, she decided once again to move back to London. So she moved in to the Stafford Hotel in St. James Place near Piccadilly, which during the war had been a club for the British and American forces. So she kind of knew it already. Um, and the hotel's regulars uh, came to know Nancy. She was kind of like part of the fam. Um, in fact, Prince Charles met with Nancy and made a donation to the Stafford Hotel from the Prince of Wales Trust to cover her stay in the hotel. Wow, that's cool. Yeah. I've never done an impression of him before. <laughs> the only thing I think of with him is that at one of the Queen's many events, he made a speech and he sort of referred to her as Your Highness and then sort of went, Mummy. And it's like, oh, you're a grandfather. You can't, you can't call your mum Mummy. Beyond the age of about four, five, Mummy's no mummy. good. Yeah, Mummy's no good. Mummy. Daddy Gross. forever. Daddy forever. <laughs> okay, daddy. Hashtag daddy forever. No, please, daddy, please. <laughs> What's the rest of that sentence? Give me some more money. <laughs> I want a little holiday, daddy, yeah. for my horsies. Yeah, my horsies need a holiday, daddy. <laughs> my horsies are very stressed. <laughs> oh, call, daddy, call, do cover the horsies holiday. <laughs> calling Prince Philip daddy. Daddy. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. He's such a daddy. That's, I'm uncomfortable. <laughs> So anyway, uh, she's living at this hotel and in the mornings she'd usually be found at the hotel bar about 11am, sipping on her first G of tea oh, of the day. She's oh, earned it. She's earned it. She's bloody earned it. She's done enough. What year? So she's like, she's going to be like 140 by now. <laughs> this, is in, this is in 2001 that she moved. 
So she's late 80s, 89, is it? She celebrated her 90th birthday at the hotel. Um, and in 2003, she decided to move to a nursing facility for retired ex-servicemen and women, where she lived until she passed away in 2011 at the age of 98. That Whoa. is quite a good effort. Isn't so that ridiculous? she lived through the, the Saints draw in 2010. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and where was she? Where was she? Where Nancy? was she? Nancy Drew? Well, they did. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. I don't think I've ever been prouder of a joke you've made. And that's saying a that lot. That says a lot. Because you try so hard. No, that's really not positive. <laughs> I'm trying to spin it, but it's not. <laughs> that was a good one. That was a good one. So I want to end on two quotes from Nancy, if I may. This is one from her saying, Freedom is the only thing worth living for. While I was doing that work, I used to think it didn't matter if I died, because without freedom, there's no point in living. Beautiful. But another one from her was, I was never afraid. I was too busy to be afraid. <laughs> I love her so much. She's always running errands. Yeah, she's busy. She's just riding on her bike. School pickups, <laughs> painting. Fighting the bank manager. Fighting the bank manager. I'm trying to refinance. I'm um, playing a Game Nazis. Boy. That's the sound of the judo chop, Dave. Look it up. Well, I think that <laughs> everyone in the, in the barracks is like, what was that? Oh. It's like someone's just been judo chopped. No, out just of it. Nancy. That's the sound of Nancy's judo chop. <laughs> yeah, okay. There she goes. She's practicing. And that's it for Nancy <laughs> Wake. Uh, this is a spin off of our podcast, Do Go On, uh, which has over 200 episodes that you can listen to. If you liked this topic, you can check out some of our other World War II related episodes, like The Escape from Colditz Castle, The Last Japanese Soldier, Mad Jack Churchill, and heaps, heaps more. Um, subscribe for free on your favorite podcast app, and be sure to subscribe to this channel and check out our other videos. Why didn't you mention we did an episode on the Wiggles? That's not World War II. Oh. Bigfoot? Oh, not World War II. Well, maybe. Chernobyl? Not World War II. Uh, Pantera. Definitely World War II. And Pantera. Thank you. 